Hey guys, this video is sponsored by SteelSeries, so make sure to stick around after the end to find out how you can get a discount on your next order. When you mention the name Volition, I think most people would immediately think about the Saints Row series. But for me, it's always been one of their earlier titles with the original Red Faction and its sequels. Set in the year 2075, the first game was a first-person shooter with the premise that after Earth's natural resources were depleted by Zoomers and their genetically enhanced offspring, humanity has taken to exploring other planets for minerals, one of them being Mars, which is where the majority of the game takes place. In the first game, you're playing as a guy named Parker, who lands a gig working for the Altor Mining Corporation, but then soon finds out that working there is worse than being a moderator on a Discord server. Workers are treated like crap, they lack basic human rights, living and working conditions are dangerous, and worse than that, there's a disease called the plague that's killing off people at random. And then there's the plague killing off miners left and right. So really, 2075 doesn't sound all that different to the current year. So a rebellion is launched by the eponymous Red Faction group, and Parker finds himself caught in the middle of it. And that's kind of the same premise from game to game. You're pretty much just fighting back against some kind of powerful organization, whether it be the Altor Mining Corporation, mercenaries, or various military and other factions in the sequels. But it all started way back in 2001, when a lowly miner named Parker kicked the whole thing off. Okay. Let's go. Now, Parker doesn't utter so much as a single word during the gameplay itself, but during cinematics, he's frequently chatty, showing off the kind of lip syncing and facial animation that I've really come to expect from early 2000s gaming. And it might have just gone down as another shooter from that same time period, only it did have a pretty nifty trick up its sleeve. You see, there was one main thing in particular that Red Faction was banking on. Just go and watch any of those old trailers or gameplay demos and you'll see what I'm talking about. And this thing was the Geomod technology. It's a pretty cool idea for the time. It's a brand new engine where you could blow down walls, you could carve your own path through the environment to achieve your goals and all that kind of stuff. And for the first five or 10 minutes of the game, it actually seems like they pulled the whole thing off. But it doesn't take long to play to see that the engine's kinda superficial at best. And outside of a handful of instances, most of which are more or less scripted, you don't even really have to worry about destroying walls to progress. One section really early on when you're making your way out of the mines has got this APC crossing a bridge. And you can just shoot this bridge apart with a rocket launcher and watch that APC tumble off the ledge. This kind of stuff is about the best the engine ever gets, and it's just a bit of a bummer that you don't get to see it more often for the rest of the game. Don't do it, please! This Geomod stuff was just still a burgeoning concept, and while I don't think that they really mastered it here, I do have to admit that it's an interesting mechanic, so you've got to give it credit. I don't think it's a bad looking game either, it's about on par with whatever was out at the same time. There's a space station level near the end of the campaign that I think just still looks gorgeous, with really impressive lighting, and the scale of some of these other areas is great too. Now there's two other things I think are worth mentioning with the engine, and that's the way it handles mirrors and glass. Die, scum! Ah! Oh! Over here! The way this engine handles mirrors has to be in the top 10, or maybe bottom 10 I should say, for working mirrors in video games. I know SWAT 4 had some pretty bad mirrors, and though I also never played it, I know that Mafia 3 had mirrors that apparently looked like a gateway to hell. But man, these mirrors in Red Faction, they're definitely up there, and it's very clearly just a television screen playing back what's standing in front of it. It's kind of like having a Zoom meeting with yourself. On a positive note though, the other thing is the glass. Now, you see, in pretty much every other FPS I'd played up until that point, if you shot a window, it broke. It didn't matter where you shot it, it just broke. In Red Faction, though, the window would shatter depending on the spot you actually hit it, and it looked way more dynamic, and I think it might have been the first time that I've ever seen a game do this. One of the simplest comparisons to make with Red Faction, I think, is Half-Life. I mean, it's pretty much Half-Life on Mars. Which, having said that, I think is kind of funny. Considering that Half-Life 2 would take that realistic glass physics even further, having individual shards you could chip away. But I really do think that Red Faction's taken a lot of cues here from that iconic game, featuring our favourite non-speaking theoretical physicist. I mean, it's very similar in the way that you start off with no weapon, before then getting a melee weapon and a pistol. In Half-Life it was the crowbar and a glock, and in Red Faction it's the stun prod and the altor pistol. This all happens a lot quicker in Red Faction though, within the span of about 30 seconds, but still, it's the same formula. Like Half-Life 2, the progression through the world is also done in real time, as you move seamlessly from one area to the next. 
Later on, there is a couple of times when it changes locations, but you're still moving from point to point yourself. You're rarely teleported and suddenly in this entirely new area, and you can usually backtrack if you really want to as well. It also has a very similar weapon selection system with weapons broken down into categories. And instead of a HEV suit with a power supply, it's a mining suit, which even has a very similar looking helmet to the HEV suit. There's even a bit later on in the game when you're captured and lose all of your weapons. Yeah, sounds familiar. Though it doesn't really last all that long because Red Faction's pacing in the second half of its campaign is just all over the place. And I think that's really the good and the bad part about Red Faction is that campaign. I mean, it starts off so strong, it has this really great sense of momentum, but then about halfway through, it just kind of nosedives and it never really recovers, just feeling kind of rushed right up until the end. <laughs> Right, so the start of the game is actually pretty cool. You're inside the mines at the time the revolution begins, and then from that point on, all you're really trying to do is meet up with the resistance so you can get the hell off the planet. These early areas in the mine introduce the pistol, the right shield, and the cattle prod. Cattle prod? No, what the fuck's that thing called? These early areas in the mine introduce the pistol, the right shield, and the right prod. The latter two you'll probably never use. I say that about the right shield because it's purely a defensive weapon, and about all you can do with it is whack someone with it, which does so little damage that I think you'd hurt them more if you farted in their face. Scum! And the same thing with the right baton, because whenever you've got this thing, you'll always have a pistol handy, so there's no real reason to swap from a ranged weapon to a melee one. If you could have used the shield and the baton at the same time, well then they might have really been cooking with gas. Like maybe you could bash someone with a shield to stun them, and then use that baton for a finisher. But alas, they're both about as useful as a blind cameraman at a porno shoot. Need help! The pistol isn't very good either, and the spread on this thing when you're shooting it is absolutely ludicrous. I mean, it has to be one of the most inaccurate pistols of all time. Doesn't help that the enemies have this tendency to slide all over the place like they're wearing roller skates. Yeah, and get used to hearing the same enemy dialogue over and over, because these old tall guys have about three or four lines of banter, and they seem to repeat it ad nauseum. Just you and me, Miner! Oh. And I think anyone who's played this game a fair bit is gonna know exactly what I'm talking about. Just you and me, Miner! I do have to say though, seeing them go from a trash-talking tough guy to shitting their pants when they've been injured is pretty damn funny. Ah. From this point on, you're also introduced to your hacker buddy Hendrix, who gives useful information along the way about where to go and what to do, along with the goals of the Red Faction. Not to mention just being an absolute bro of the highest tier. Thank, Thank God. God these starting areas, I think, also show off the Geomod stuff pretty well too, letting you play around with some explosive charges and the rocket launcher. There's a massive driller that I think only shows up once in the entire game, and if this thing ain't a blatant reference to Total Recall, then I don't know what's real anymore. No shit. And then not too soon after this, you get the shotgun, which is actually pretty damn awesome. <laughs> All weapons in the game have a primary and an alternate fire mode, and the alt fire for this thing is a fast firing mode, unloading all of your shells super quickly. Traitor. I've always really loved the look and the sound of this shotgun, and it's really effective against these first few enemy types. And I mean, just listen to it, it's glorious. After that, you'll probably find the assault rifle, which is again pretty damn useful, offering burst and full auto firing modes. There's one thing I also want to bring up at this point, and that's the music, which is fucking awesome. One of my favorite tracks comes at a point when you first get to drive a submarine, and it is pure, unfiltered, early 2000s video game soundtrack at its absolute finest. The campaign I think is definitely saved early on here by some of these vehicle sections, especially the submarine and that gunship later on, both of which control super smoothly and are just a blast to use, no pun intended. But these also help to reinforce the size of the planet itself, I mean you often forget that you're not in Kansas anymore, you're now on Mars and these sections are always these long, cavernous tunnels that really help to re-establish how you're a small cog in a very vast and empty machine. Well, I mean, not empty, there's plenty of enemy gunships waiting for you along the way, and it's really fun blowing them to smithereens. 
I'd expect no less from the same developers who created the Descent series. And with those gunship sections in particular, I mean, all I think it needed was a few more different flying enemies, and these sections could have really felt like a spiritual successor. I can't help but feel that there was wasted potential here. I mean, the Descent games were set inside mines that were taken over by hostile robots, and it would have been a really perfect opportunity to introduce a new enemy type here. They could have been like reprogrammed bots that Altor had fashion to deal with the rebels, something like that. But if we start talking about missed opportunities, well, we're all gonna be here until we start to bleed from our assholes. If you're not gonna help, shut up. Anyway, at this point, things start to take a bit of a shift and it turns into a stealth game. Well, optional stealth. We are trying to find and escort an Altor employee to the rebels. Take the silence pistol. Keep it holstered under your suit. Use it only when you absolutely have to. The stealth here doesn't try to be super complex. It's about as simple as just staying a fair distance away from someone so they can't detect you. If you are detected, you can pretty much shoot your way through the whole thing anyway. It's just, for some reason, you can't hold other weapons when you're in disguise, so you're limited to the pistol. I don't know, I guess Parker's outfits doesn't have enough pockets or something. Once you find this guy who works for Altor, you've then got to babysit him until you link up with the Red Faction. Then there's a series of levels that has to be one of the coolest bits in the whole campaign when you get to fly a gunship. Battle ends with a boss fight against a big ass robot, which has to be lured and then trapped inside a giant incinerator shaft. And I do kind of appreciate how there's more to that boss fight than just kind of shooting it until it explodes. Thank, Thank God. God. It's also probably around this time you'll find the submachine gun for the first time. And not only does this share the same ammo as the pistol, but it also lets you swap out to the same ammo as the assault rifle, essentially making both guns redundant. I don't know the logistics of how a gun can use two ammo types like that, but I mean, hey, it's the future. We're on Mars, so who gives a shit? At this point, it shakes things up again. I mean, after probably getting bored from escorting that asshole for the last half hour, now you're moving through caverns and underground tunnels, having to fight these weird looking monsters along with driving the world's slowest ATV. Hang on, I'm gonna floor it! Watch out! Move! 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 At this point is where things start to head south with the introduction of one of the main antagonists, an evil scientist named Kapek, who kind of looks like a shriveled nutsack. And if you say Kapek five times really fast, it almost kind of sounds like you're saying cope. Keck. Die, Kapek! You spend a fair bit of time chasing this guy, during which he chimes in on the radio to intimidate you, because I guess Parker's frequency is given out more than your mum's mobile number. Something is hungry. Until you finally corner him for what's probably the toughest fight in the game. It's also, I think, one of the most dreadful, because he fires out these energy blasts which just go straight through solid walls. Not to mention, they can kill you in almost a single shot. <laughs> And after he's dead, it really starts to mark the beginning of the end for this campaign. Because I really do think all of what comes next is just such a stark contrast in quality. And hundreds more will die unless we find a cure for the plague. I mean, look, I'm not saying the first half is a masterpiece. It has some crappy spots here and there. And there is a fair few superfluous elements as well. I mean, I never really used weapons like the grenade, the flamethrower, or the sniper rifle. I might have used them once or twice, but they're never essential. And I could see how people could look back fondly on this game because they're probably just remembering this first half. Because sadly from this point on is where it really goes to shit. Cold shit in fact. Damn it! Let me ask you a question, right? Where do you go after you've already killed off the only serious antagonist you've had at this point? Well, you introduce another one, I guess. And this is in the form of a mercenary group sent in to clean up the mess. Again, sounds familiar. Only these guys are a huge step up in challenge from the Altor security forces. These guys carry one of the most powerful weapons in the entire game, the Precision Rifle, which is a semi-automatic scoped weapon that does insane damage and makes a pretty cool sound to boot. Along with carrying a belt-fed machine gun, both of which can absolutely ruin your day. But both of these, I can deal with. It's those guys carrying the goddamn X-ray railguns which brought my blood to an absolute boil. You see, one of the last weapons you'll get in the game is a railgun that can both see and shoot through walls. And look, that's fine and dandy. It's just the enemies can use this weapon as well. And that X-ray capability is something that swings two ways. Basically what I'm saying is you're gonna get fucked and you're not even gonna see it coming half the time. Eat my shorts! 
death. And there really are times when it seems the only way to avoid it is to know that it's coming. Kind of feels like it removes all the skill at this point and just instead forces the player to memorize enemy locations. Death! <laughs> And look, if there's any prospective game developers out there watching this, of which I'm sure there is, can I just say to you directly, please don't do this in your game. There's nothing fun about an enemy that can kill you in a single hit. All I can say here is thank God for quick saves. I also just really find that from this point on, the whole game seems to feel very rushed and kind of unfinished. You'll frequently move through areas which lack any real detail or interesting landmarks, things like copy-pasted rooms that lack memorable features. And the only thing that slows you down here is dealing with the abundance of these mercenaries that's not navigating the environments. You drive an APC at one point, which handles like absolute dog shit, and it kind of shows how these flight controls don't really work all that well on a land vehicle. The vehicles are controlled with the directional keys for moving, but the mouse for looking and shooting. And that works fine with the submarine and the gunship, because you can obviously control the direction you're moving and your momentum with the strafe keys. In an APC though, you have to turn left or right to face someone to shoot them, and it kind of forces you to constantly change direction to shoot them, which kind of kills momentum with the vehicle. Makes sense? The final boss though, who gets introduced about half an hour before you fight her, is the leader of the mercenary group, and she uses the same technology that Kopec had hovering around with a super powerful energy shield before then fighting Parker on foot. So, in essence, this is almost like a recycled boss fight. But worse than that though, is this final puzzle you need to solve. You see, those damn dirty mercenaries have activated a bomb that's gonna blow the whole base to kingdom come to help them hide their tracks. Again, sound familiar? Only this thing is like a one-off puzzle where you've got to input these two codes in a time limit or else the bomb detonates and you die. The thing is, the code changes every single time you try it. So it's really just luck that you're gonna memorize it in time. And why they decided to end the game on a mechanic like this when they hadn't used anything like this in the game prior is just beyond me. But what a fitting end to a game that started off so strong and then kind of slowly flushed its head down the toilet. And it's one of those reasons why when I see people talking about this game and how amazing it was, it always makes me think that they're really just remembering those first couple of hours of the campaign, which are admittedly pretty damn good. And I think they're just kind of forgetting about all the stupid crap that happens in the second half. Die, scum! Ah! Still though, there is something about those 6th generation console games and just that period in general which really rubs people's nostalgia dick in just the right way. And that's also why I think that despite its many faults and shortcomings, you'd kind of struggle to find people who talk badly about it. Most people I speak to who played this thing absolutely rave about it, and that's fair enough. Especially when you consider that it also had a really good PlayStation 2 port. I mean, this is before games like Time Splitters 2, Medal of Honor Frontline, 007 Nightfire, or Killzone. So a shooter about playing as a rebel fighter on Mars with a few destructible walls here and there, and combat subs and gunships to fly around in, well, yeah, I'd buy that for a dollar. I think aside from the first Halo game, which came out around the same time, it also might have been one of the first FPS games that let you control different vehicles like that, and also that did it so well. The only other game I can remember that did it was Terminator Skynet back in 1996. Yeah. Shit. But let's not go back to the past to play those shitty games that suck ass. Let's look into the future. In fact, a year later in 2002 when Volition followed it up with a sequel, Red Faction 2. With this though, I think you'd actually be a bit more hard pressed to find people who say great things about it. Because Red Faction 2, I think, really joins that long roster of FPS sequels that just aren't anywhere near as good as their predecessors. Along with games like Blood 2, Fear 2, and Gao Gun 2. The setup is that the technology Copec created on Mars has now fallen into the hands of the EDF, or the Earth Defense Force for short, and I don't know what it is with this faction in FPS games. I mean, there was an EDF in Duke Nukem, and also one in Cirrus Sam as well. Anyway, these guys have weaponized this technology, and now it's being used by a dictator named Sopot. And you're playing as an elite soldier named Alias, working with a squad of people with equally badass sounding names, as you carry out missions on Sopot's orders. While the premise itself makes sense, the writing and the dialogue in this thing really is in a league of its own. And it makes the first game seem like Gone with the Wind in comparison. You have to consider when this thing came out, I mean this was the early 2000s, when skate and punk culture were an all time high and it seemed like so many games and films were doing their best to appeal to teenagers. 
And I really feel like this kind of culture seeped over into video games, with the writing always seemingly trying to appeal to that basic demographic of adolescent kids who thought that spiked hair and deep voices was all you needed to make your character cool. Raptor, resistance heavy, out number 15 to 1, under control. So you've got characters called Shrike, Quill, Raptor, and Molov. I mean, they just sound like the most generic tough guy names you could come up with. Ah, uh, yeah. I witnessed it all. It's just really cheesy stuff, and you don't have to watch further than some of those early cinematics or listen to some of the dialogue to pick up on that. Shrike. Vehicles. A madman with a taste for speed. A madman with a taste for speed. I mean, Jesus Christ, someone wrote that line with a straight face. It's also around the time when it seemed that celebrities would pop up more doing voices in video games. Vice City came out around the same time, and although Red Faction doesn't have anywhere near that kind of lineup, it does have some notable actors with Lance Henriksen and Jason Statham. We were created to fight. When Tangier arrives, you three will be declared enemies of the state and publicly executed. I witnessed it all. Even more than that though, the guy who voices Soapot is also the same guy who played Bub in Day the Dead. Player on the other hand is named Alias, a pretty forgettable guy who barely talks throughout the entire game. Seems like he's someone we're supposed to identify with and feel thrust into his shoes, but honestly, who knows. Let's go Alias! The game opens with barely any explanation as to what's happening, but you get the gist that you're playing as Alias and working for Soapot, attacking a rebel base to steal an important piece of tech. This opening level lasts for all the five minutes, and then during a cinematic which cuts two years ahead into the future, it now turns out you're being hunted by Sopot and have instead teamed up with the Red Faction. Okay. For the honor of the Commonwealth, tonight Sopot dies. Now the goal is to hunt down Sopot and assassinate him for the good of the Commonwealth, and I've got to say, as an Australian, all I can do is smile when I hear the word Commonwealth used in a video game. And I do have to admit that when you finally catch up to Sopot, the way this guy dies is pretty funny. So after getting captured by Alias, he's locked into a silo as a rocket takes off, which then sets the guy on fire, causing him to run around screaming as he burns to death. And look, all other issues aside, I have to admit that is entertaining as fuck. I witnessed it all. Anyway, this then forms the next main objectives for the next couple of hours before, yet again, allegiance has changed and now your buddies have turned on you. So now the goal becomes to fight back against your buddies or former buddies one by one. These guys aren't Foxhound though and this ain't Metal Gear Solid, so don't expect any groundbreaking or innovative boss fights. It's about the most textbook boss fights you're ever gonna see. That being, just give the boss a bazillion health points and make the player shoot them with so much firepower that in reality, they'd be completely deatomized. Overall, the shooting ain't amazing and about the only thing I think they've improved with the combat is that there's now a dedicated grenade throw button. Being able to just press the G button and throw out one of these things is a huge improvement. But overall, it just feels like so little's been done here to build upon the shooting in the first game. The fact you could probably get through the entire thing without ever having to change weapons is a pretty big testament to how sloppy the shooting is, and just how repetitive the combat is, relegated mostly to just the same two or three enemies over and over. You've got guys with guns, you've got guys with guns, or you've got guys with guns. Could have been an interesting moral dilemma if they address how you're now shooting your former allies, but the story never takes enough time to establish any of that for it to have any meaning. Even the few times when they try something different though, kinda sucks. Like when you've got to shoot these kamikaze robot spiders, which are the most annoying enemies in the entire game. Yeah, two things I hate the most in video games, spiders and kamikaze enemies. But the only way they could have made these things worse was if they left behind some kind of residue on the screen when they blew up. I think the biggest blunder though is that this really is a console game first and foremost that's been ported to the PC. And there's a few main ways I think in which that's pretty obvious. Right off the bat, the PC version's been outsourced to an entirely different developer. Instead of Volition, this version was worked on by Outrage Games, and yeah, what an ironic title. Aside from that though, there's no way to change the visual settings in the game. It all has to be done through a launcher. And about all you can modify in the game itself are the brightness settings and the controller sensitivity. You get checkpoints at the beginning of each new area, which is also kind of disruptive. Because instead of like a subtle loading screen with a small graphic, you get this giant one that covers the entire screen. And the actual sense of progression through an environment, which is part of what made that first game so good, is just gone entirely. It's also got a much simpler health system. Instead of health and armor to worry about, you've now got a regenerating health system similar to the one from Halo. 
playing through this now on the Xbox Series X is actually, I think, one of the better ways to play it. The PC version ain't exactly broken, but it ain't exactly great either. You pretty much have to run this little program side by side so you can fix the resolution as well as that horrendous FOV. But visually, aside from the Xbox running in a 4x3 ratio and the PC in 16x9, they still look almost identical. Damn. Bit of more than I can shoot. It's also just really, I think, a downgraded game from the first one in so many other ways too. I mean, for starters, for a lot of these new vehicle sections, they're now on rails. You fly in the back of a gunship at one point and then on a tank as well, but all you can really do here is shoot at things as they pass by. It's really little more than just descriptive shooting gallery. The submarine section is kind of similar to the first game in that at least you've got total control, but I mean, look at it. It just looks like shit. You can barely see ahead of you. Compare that to the first game and just look at how much better the visibility is as well. Kind of goes into my next point, which is how I'm not even sure that this is a better looking game. Everything just looks so blurry and flat. And about the only thing I liked here visually was that rain effect that they use, I think, once in the entire game. And there's just always something about rain effects in sixth generation video games that does it for me. Time Splitters 2 had a really good looking one in that Neo Tokyo level, and so did Metal Gear Solid 2. Freeze. More. Come to think of it, this is Red Faction 2. So maybe it's just sequels in general have really good rain effects. Look, I'm a simple man, alright? I like two things in my video games. Titties and good looking rain effects. I do think some of the weapon modeling looks better than the first game, and there are some nice looking environments here and there, but in terms of the textures and the character modeling, it honestly, I think, looks worse off than the previous game. Don't ever get me started on the cinematics and the facial animation too. And I don't think their eyes even moved this time. I mean, at least in the first game, Parker's buggy little eyes would roll around in his skull a bit to give the guy a bit more life. Here though, their mouths just open and shut like they're a marionette. You! Inside! Come out with your hands up! This cinematic at the end of the game here always cracks me up too, where your buddy Tangier is slowly sneaking towards the window, and Molov just aims at her without actually firing. I mean, what's he waiting for? What are you waiting for? You'd also hope they'd put that Geomud stuff to better use here, but again, there's really only a handful of times it even comes into play, and again, it's mostly scripted stuff anyway. Early on, there's a gun turret you need to avoid, and you can destroy these office cubicles to flank it and to shut it down. And it almost seems like this is teaching you for things that are going to come, but it's the only time in the entire game where you need to do this. Throughout this whole first level, you've got a grenade launcher and a bunch of ammo, but it almost kind of falsely advertises the rest of the game. Because from this point on, you're going to be using some of the most generic hit-scanning weapons that have ever been seen in an FPS. During that sequence inside the tank, you can shoot out the front of certain buildings, but this has no tactical advantage whatsoever. And these buildings are about as empty as the streets are anyway. At that point too, when you're on that section in the gunship, you'd really want to be able to just level these buildings with all these missiles, but they all seem to be impervious to your attacks. You ever play that game Path of Neo? Well, there's that really cool level in it when you're on the back of a minigun, as you're trying to rescue Morpheus from this building, and twice in this level, you can see two different buildings get demolished. This is the kind of thing you want to see in Red Faction 2, but it's like the gunship that I'm traveling in may as well be shooting out nerf darts. Speckled throughout the campaign, there's instances when you can destroy the occasional wall, or the floor to circumvent a more direct route. But again, it's not taking you anywhere you don't need to go. I think the cleverest it ever gets is when you're inside this mech suit and you come to a tunnel that's got a very clearly labelled height limit. So what do you do? Well, you blow the ceiling off so you can get through. Stuff like this I think is really cool and it really shows you the potential that the engine had. Next we come to the weapons and there's so many guns in Red Faction 2 here, only half of them are just completely useless or made redundant by newer guns that you keep coming across. You've got a pistol returning from the first game, though the difference here is that they can now be dual wielded. I never thought I'd see the day where dual SMGs are completely underwhelming either, but here we are with the machine pistols. And I think the main reason these things feel so crappy is the combination of the sound effect and that really piss weak impact it has when you hit enemies. Enemies don't really react at all to getting shot by these things, aside from having so many sparks coming off their body armor that it's like they've got a sparkler tucked into their shirt. Then for some reason they decided to add in another SMG, this time a silenced one, which is completely pointless because there's no stealth in the game at all. And what is with this thing's stock sound effect? 
If that's not enough, they've added in yet another SMG weapon with these nano pistols you get within literally like the last 15 minutes of the game. Am I starting to prove my point here how just redundant some of these guns are? Returning again from the first game is what's basically like an updated shotgun and assault rifle. The main difference is instead of a faster firing mode for the shotgun, it gets incendiary shells, which are really just more of a spectacle and not really all that practical. And then the assault rifle is pretty much unchanged outside of its appearance. The primary fire mode is still a more accurate burst fire and the secondary is full auto. But this weapon is made completely redundant as soon as you find the nanotech rifle. That not only comes with an underslung grenade launcher, but also just outright wall hacks, showing your enemies through cover with this giant marker. And the fact that it also uses the exact same ammo type as the assault rifle, I think makes it even more superior. Now, I do think this kind of thing would have been fine for like an 8 to 10 hour long campaign, but you really do find this thing less than half an hour after getting that assault rifle for the first time, and you might not even use it before you get this objective upgrade. The mercenary rifle and the railgun both make a return, and again, they control almost exactly the same. The main difference with the rifle is that it now takes up about twice as much of the screen. And it also has this really odd crosshair because someone thought it would be a good idea to give every gun in the game a different fucking crosshair. I mean, whatever happened to the good old plus shape? How about even taking the max pain route and making it like a single pixel? That's all you ever need anyway. This weapon though is incredibly useful for one of the last areas in the game, where you've got to move through this gauntlet of mutants and nanotech soldiers, and the reason I say this thing is so good is because it's really effective at shooting their heads off. This whole area gave me a real time splitters vibe too. It reminded me a lot of those horror levels where you had to use a shotgun to decapitate zombies. Plus the nanotech soldiers, I think, also look very similar to the time splitters, with this weird sort of energy aura that's coming off them. Again, it's like poetry, it's sort of they rhyme. I guess the weaker counterpart to the precision rifle is the actual sniper rifle, which I don't think you even really need to use at all in the entire game. The first time you kind of need to use one is when you're having to deal with other snipers on nearby buildings. But then later on, when you're having to shoot this endless swarm of bad guys who keep popping up in all these windows, by that point, you've got the precision rifle. So again, the sniper rifle is another redundant weapon before it even had time to make itself be missed. On the plus side though, I do have to say that I like the grenade launcher in this game. Got it. Only because it actually feels like I'm doing something when I use it, leaving behind a pretty huge impact mark and doing a lot of splash damage. And if there was enough ammo for it, I'd play through the entire game with this thing. Definitely makes those first few opening levels a complete joke. The Wasp is like a big up, slower firing rocket launcher, which is only really useful for two boss fights in the entire game. Mostly just the final fight against Molov. Only because you not only have to fight this guy in his mech suit, but then again, after you've destroyed it, when he's running around on foot with a fucking railgun. Kind of reminds me of the Hitler fight at the end of Wolfenstein 3D. The only cover you get is this single metal pole in the middle of the room, and you'll want to get him out of that mech suit nice and quick with the Wasp because he's an outright aimbot with that railgun, let me tell ya. Fuck you. Red Faction 2's Ultimate Mercy is that it's a super short game, in fact it really might be one of the shortest FPS campaigns I think I've ever played. Aside from maybe Rogue Warrior, which I think can be finished in 2 or 3 hours, Red Faction 2 I'd say is a little bit over 3. And that's three hours of your life that you're never going to get back, bitch. He's getting away. There's not really any point to replaying through this either, unless you want to play through it again on a high difficulty mode to unlock things like low resolution concept art, yeah, goody gumdrops, or to see the alternate endings, because apparently there's four in total. Though every single time I finish this thing, regardless of how I've played, I've always seemed to get the same one. If you want to see the same cinematics with just a different narration though, well, be my guest. But this ain't no Fallout New Vegas endings, let me put it that way. Now, I think regardless of whether or not someone enjoyed Red Faction 2, the fact remains that it was overall a bit of a step backwards. So what do you do after you take a step backwards? Well, how about stepping forward and in an entirely new direction? Well, that's what Volition did seven years later with Red Faction Guerrilla, which I think for a lot of people is regarded as the best in the series. If nothing else, it's definitely the fan favorite. Someone else must have realized that too, because this is the only one in the franchise that ever got a remaster. Unlike the last two games though, instead of this being a linear first person shooter, it's now an open world third person chaos sandbox. And pretty much every single structure you come across here can be destroyed in one way or another, and often needs to be. 
When it comes to games that let you blow shit up, this is arguably one of the best of them. And the only other game I can think of that even comes close to this to let you create this much utter carnage are the Just Cause games. Red Faction Guerrilla comes from around that time period in gaming too, where every main character was a gruff looking dude with a shaved head. Yeah, and not balding either, like someone shaving their hair off on purpose. And as a guy whose hair is rapidly disappearing as I'm slowly creeping into middle age, I'll never understand how someone can willingly do that. Anyway, back to my point, you had characters like Cole in Infamous, Nathan Hale in Resistance 2, Starkiller in Force Unleashed, and even old mate Sam Fisher got the chop, with his edgy appearance in Splinter Cell Double Agent. Hair ain't the only thing missing here either though, because they also forgot to include any kind of memorable story, and again, it's not the most engaging premise. I'm on it. You're playing as a dude named Alec Mason, coming to Master C's brother who is promptly killed by the EDF, who are serving as the main enemy faction this time. <laughs> Alec then joins up with a mostly forgettable cast of characters who are all working with the Red Faction. <laughs> it fits. And I will say though that I do like how the game outright references Red Faction 1. I mean the starting area is even named after Parker. There's an area named after Hendrix and Eos and there's references to Ultor Mining Corporation as well. So it sure seems to treat the series with more love than the second game did, I mean that's for sure. But this game has an almost non-existent story outside of that. I mean the basic gist is that the EDF are bad and you've just got to stop them. I know this is a lot to take in, but you're going to have to trust us. Whereas in most open world games, the side missions are like a fun distraction to the main missions. In Red Faction Guerrilla, the side missions are the main ones. Like I said, the main enemy faction here is the EDF, and each area on Mars has to be liberated back from these guys. And while there's usually like a few main missions to complete, you're gonna spend the majority of your time here completing guerrilla missions. The same half a dozen side missions over and over to loosen their control. Every time you finish one of these, the EDF's grip is reduced on the area, and it's one step closer to liberation. And you have to remove all of their control to capture an area entirely. And that's really the main issue here because the missions you're doing in the first area are the same ones you're going to be doing right up until the end with pretty much nothing changed. Like it might involve rescuing hostages, helping out in EDF raids, or driving around on the back of a jeep, blasting out speed metal and causing all that mayhem. And yeah, look, it's fun the first couple of times you do these, but it starts to get pretty repetitive sooner than it should. Another way to remove their control is to destroy important landmarks like buildings, wind turbines, Starbucks, and other pivotal resources that the EDF seem important. <laughs> but again, the same way you destroy these buildings doesn't ever really change. I mean, you get better weapons and you get more effective at it, but it's just the same process from the start of the game right up until the end. This is also a pretty damn grindy game. All of the best weapons and the toys need to be purchased, and that's all done by collecting salvage, which is earned mostly through missions or just by destroying buildings and picking this stuff up off the ground. And you are gonna spend a whole lot of time here collecting this stuff. Despite it being pretty grindy though, it is still a pretty fun game to mess around with. The backpack and its many mods also gives you a whole heap of options to play around with as well. Like a mod that thrusts you up into the air, which also somehow turns you into a human mortar, ripping through buildings and other solid objects. Or an upgrade that surrounds you in a shield as you can charge forward, destroying anything in your path. In what might be one of the dumbest things I've ever seen though, the difficulty modes affect how expensive these upgrades are, and it gets exponentially more expensive the higher the upgrade is. I felt no shame in turning this thing down to casual mode just to buy these upgrades, because on casual mode, they're almost half the price of what they cost on hard and normal. And look, I'm buggered if I'm gonna spend double the time collecting literal junk just to unlock the ability to make the game more fun. But I think the biggest blunder here are the vehicle controls because they're just awful. Which for a game where you spend probably 70% of the time driving around is an absolute cardinal sin. The issue is that whenever you get airborne, you lose control, which is fine. I mean, yeah, that makes sense, and that's how cars work. But because the roads are so bumpy, this happens frequently. And it's kind of like these quick periods, like a nanosecond or so, where it feels like you've lost control of the car. It's an open world game from the late 2000s, but it also kind of feels like one from the early 2000s, with basic missions that just involve killing a bunch of people, driving somewhere, or blowing something up. This was before the oversaturation of open world games that we'd get in the coming years with things like the Far Cry and the Assassin's Creed games. 
but I mean, we'd still had GTA 4 a year prior to this. So then coming into something like Guerrilla, which does kind of feel destitute in comparison, well, it's a bit of a downgrade. That's also the problem, I guess, when your entire game is set on a barren, empty red rock. But you know what? None of that shit matters when things start blowing up. Volition have called this engine the Geomod 2.0, and yeah, that ain't no bullshit. Because this is the kind of destruction I really wanted to see in the first game, and now it's finally here. Your melee weapon is a hammer, which may as well be forged by the gods of Asgard, because it tears through almost every single surface with a single hit. And I love too how Mason is basically wearing like a high-vis outfit, just to make him look even more like a construction worker when he carries this thing around. But you'll also be using remote charges and the rocket launcher to do your demolition work here as well, which really does still look amazing at times. Even more so when you consider that this is from 2009. Nine? In fact, the only game I can think of that even comes close, apart from the sequel Armageddon, is a game on Steam called Teardown, which came out like a year or so ago. Really kind of feels like for a decade there that Gorilla was the poster child for how destruction in a video game should be handled. The only downside is that you can't destroy the terrain, only the buildings and all these structures, which is a bit of a downgrade in a way. But still, there's just something so visceral about bringing an entire building down through sheer determination and little more than just an inanimate piece of metal. At one point, I destroyed like a giant bridge and watching this thing shatter into a bazillion pieces and come crashing down just looked amazing. And it honestly ranked up there as one of the most gratifying moments I've had in a video game in recent memory. It also rarely ever seems to come at the expense of the performance, and someone of Volition really earned their big dick status here putting this new engine together. One of the earliest upgrades you can get is turning vehicles into salvage magnets, so any scrap you drive over is automatically collected. And then this goes hand in hand with just driving straight into buildings like a bulldozer and demolishing them entirely, picking up all of that loose scrap instantly. I've got to say that there's few things as fun in gaming as driving a truck through a building in Red Faction Guerrilla. And those instances where you can get this perfect run up and then just level an entire structure in a couple of goes is the stuff that boners are made of. One of the vehicles you get is a mech walker with these mechanical arms. It's kind of like the power loader from the end of Aliens, but on steroids. And with this thing, you can just run right through entire buildings, pulling them apart like they're made out of toilet paper. I think my main issue with this game though is that that enjoyment factor is really kind of ruined at times just by the constant presence of enemies. And honestly, I feel like the EDF in this game may as well just be called the Fun Police because that's really what it's like going up against them. As soon as you start blowing stuff up and causing mayhem, these guys pretty much pop up out of nowhere and then they just never stop coming. And it becomes outright distracting when you're trying to bring a building down to suddenly have to deal with this never-ending influx of foot soldiers. Honestly, it's like they materialize out of thin air and it's that really annoying mid-2000s gunplay where they just hit you with 100% accuracy all of the time. When they introduce snipers later on and those guys with shields, well, it gets even more annoying. The only way to stop them from coming is to simply run away, hightail it out of there until they give up the chase, or go back to one of your nearby hideouts, at which point they'll just stop chasing you instantly. The worst ones though are the gunships, because unless you've got that heat sick and upgrade for the rocket launcher, well good luck taking those things out. I honestly just got to the point where I'd let them kill me, it was far less time consuming than trying to outrun them, or head back to the nearest safe house which was like a 5 minute drive away. I guess it kinda makes sense going with the whole gorilla theme they've got going on, but it doesn't make for enjoyable gameplay when you're suddenly under attack by a platoon of soldiers and given no real option other than just running away with your towel between your legs. Yeah! Honestly, there's so much more I could say about this game and maybe in the future I'll go back and take a look at it more in depth, but for now there's not really much else I have to say about it. After playing it for like an hour or so, you've already really seen all there is to see and do. Then it's just repeating the same mechanics in a slightly different looking backdrop until it all comes to an end. The various locations on Mars do differ slightly in appearance, mostly just whatever textures they've used for the terrain, but once you find a weapon combo and a loadout that works best for you, well, I just never found a reason to change things up. Still though, it's a mighty fun game when played in short increments, and it also had a really good multiplayer mode to boot, or so I'm told. I sadly missed the boat on that one because that was around the time when I had credit card debt coming out of my ass and I had no job. Still though, this thing is easy to play and I understand now why people love it so much. 
like Red Faction Armageddon, on the other hand, is a completely different kettle of fish. And while the whole thing was seeming pretty good with Red Faction Gorilla, this right here is the game which essentially killed off the whole franchise. Released in 2011, it sure had some heavy hitters to contend with, games like Skyrim, Arkham City, not to mention Dead Space 2, which I'm sure was an influence on the change in direction they took with this one. Any idea how to get out of here? You do have to wonder though what kind of wacky Chewbacca everyone was smoking when they made this thing. I mean, after they had such a positive response to making the last game an open world destructive sandbox, someone thought it was a good idea to change it back into a linear third person shooter which, funnily enough, makes Gorilla the black sheep out of the entire bunch, considering it's the only game with that open world design. Now, I know this thing got pretty average reviews when it came out, most of which justified, and I'm supposed to shit all over it, but I still do think this game gets bashed pretty unfairly. I mean, it's not an amazing game, but as a third-person shooter, it's still perfectly fine, and I think it has some cool ideas. The only issue is that it just feels so generic. In Armageddon, you're playing as a guy named Darius Mason, a scavenger who's supposed to be a descendant of Alec Mason from Gorilla. And just like his ancestor, Darius is also taken to shaving his head. Yeah, no shit, keep trying. Along with half the other male NPCs. I mean, seriously, what is it with the shaved heads in these games? It's like everyone in the Matrix always wearing sunglasses. Anyway, after a cataclysmic event, all the inhabitants on Mars now live deep under the planet's surface in a network of tunnels, stiffing their own farts and rarely venturing out for a breath of fresh air. How could this have happened? Mason is tricked into releasing this ancient alien species known as the Plague, the most perfect name considering how annoying they are to deal with, and then he also has to stop a cultist group who are up to no good and started causing trouble in the neighborhood. Mostly though, it's another cast of forgettable nobodies, but it does have the best waifu, I think, in the entire series, with Mason's lady friend named Kara. And look, anyone who wears a high-cut one-piece leotard with the sides exposed like that is okay in my book. You are so easy to find. Just listen for the gunshots. I didn't expect to see you again. But you're gonna spend most of your time here killing things as opposed to engaging them in conversation. So again, it's one of those stories that goes in one ear and just right out the other and it ends up playing out like a pretty standard third-person shooter. I chose to play it on the PC this time just because I thought it'd be easier with the mouse and keyboard, and I gotta say, I think that was a pretty good call. I can fix it! And it sure doesn't feel like a console game firsthand with the PC tacked on as an afterthought. Well, aside from that FOV, which is painfully low. There was this one other pretty huge issue I ran into later in the game. During this bit that happened during the world's slowest minecart chase, I kept getting knocked off the cart and falling to my death. First I thought it was a bug, but then it just kept happening. Why are we not moving? And the only way that I could fix it was by forcing the game to run in 720 at 30 frames per second. Kind of made me think that maybe it had something to do with the frame rate because it was only happening when I played the game at 144 hertz. We need to be moving! Either way though, if nothing else it made for a couple of entertaining moments. Ah! Why are we not moving? Otherwise though, the controls are smooth and most of the guns are fun to use. There's actually quite a few weapons here as well, from shotguns and assault rifles, flamethrower, grenade and rocket launcher through to dual wielding pistols. And of course, it wouldn't be Red Faction at this point without your trusty hammer, and don't worry, that thing makes a return. I think it's definitely a better shooter than Gorilla was too, which is kind of to be expected considering they've completely removed those other aspects, mostly the vehicles and that open world design. The inclusion of an upgrade system again using collectible salvage, I also think encourages you to take the time to explore these environments, so it's not just a race down essentially this one long corridor. You can upgrade the damage you do with certain weapon types, you can upgrade your health points and reload times, and it's that basic concept of extrinsic rewarding that we all just take for granted. Or well, you might not even notice, but it's what keeps you coming back and entices you to keep playing. Honestly, at least half a dozen times when I was playing this, I'd planned to like take a break. I was gonna go outside and get something to eat or grab a glass of water or just take a fat shit. We need to be moving! But then I'd unlock a new upgrade and I kind of felt like I had to keep playing to try it out. About the only thing in the game that doesn't make sense to me is like this weird zombie shooting minigame that pops up at random throughout the campaign. Yeah, it's like at random I seem to get teleported to this graveyard, and then I have to shoot these Nazi zombies while women in lingerie appear on the sides of the screen. It was just weird, man, and it felt like something out of an entirely different game. I'm still trying to figure that out myself. Mason must have also inherited his backpack from his old man too, because he carries around his own little proton pack looking thing that also comes with a bunch of tricks. Like being able to force push back enemies, giving yourself a protective shield, 
going into a sort of berserk mode, increasing your damage output or sending out a shockwave, holding enemies up in the air like they're being kept in stasis. This is definitely the best one in my opinion, giving you a bit of breathing room for those precious few seconds, but more important than that, it's just fun to use. I do wish these abilities weren't all on the same cooldown, but either way, you can still pull off some pretty cool moves, and it makes it more than just shooting and reloading all the time. And that's handy because the vast amount of enemies you fight are just so boring and uncreative. Mostly just generic bad guys with guns in the form of these cultists, but for the other vast majority of the game, it's the various species of the plague that you unwittingly unleashed. And these annoying alien bug things, they aren't just creatively bankrupt, it's like a creative Great Depression. Most of them just prefer to jump around and latch onto a wall somewhere and then fling their shit at you, which is just so incredibly grating to deal with. They're not even like a serious threat either, I mean aside from a couple of variants, their attacks are glancing at best and it's just a nuisance. It's like when a younger sibling tries to fight you, you know what I mean, you just kind of feel pity for them more than anything else. There's verticality to the level design, but it only seems to be there for the benefit of these guys, who jump around more than a goddamn monkey. Not to mention, they're just completely unimaginative to look at, lacking any real defining characteristics. I mean, at least make them female and give them some big titties, and then maybe you've got something. I still think the destruction side of things is pretty fun though, and that idea of also being able to repair things is a pretty neat touch too, considering the entire series up until this point has just been about blowing everything up. Sometimes you might get too carried away during combat and completely demolish a staircase for instance, but it's just simply a matter of whipping out that nano forge and repairing it instantly. You'll even need to repair generators and other machines throughout the game too, so it is kind of cool how they've worked it into the gameplay loop. And luckily too, it seems to run pretty smoothly. Granted, I was playing this on the PC with a kind of rig that wouldn't seem out of place in a Bitcoin miner's lair, but still man, the fact it was able to pull this stuff off is impressive. Sadly though, this might be the most basic entry in the series when it comes to the vehicles though, and I think the only thing you get to actually control is a mech suit, which kind of looks like the power armor from Fallout. It is definitely fun to use though, and you're pretty much unstoppable when you're inside one of these things, which kind of begs the question is, why don't you just stain one for the entire game and wipe the floor with whatever is dumb enough to attack you? A couple of times later, you get to control a walker, which is more like a giant mechanical spider than it is its gorilla counterpart. Still though, this thing's got a cannon and a lightning gun, and again has that fantastic capability of just ripping apart everything that it touches. But that's like all they could come up with, I mean, two vehicles for the entire game. I really do feel too like this game is kind of a poor man's dead space. I mean, that over the shoulder viewpoint and skulking around these dark areas taking on horrific looking monsters just feels very similar. There's even a very similar melee attack and a stomp move. It's just that your health regenerates so quickly in Armageddon that if anything's actually going to kill you, you pretty much have to put your controller on the floor. Overall, look, it's not hard to understand why people dislike this game so much, and I don't think it's a bad game, but choosing to take it in an entirely new direction after finally finding something that players seem to enjoy with the third game just is so baffling. I also think this just comes from that time period where if a game didn't get an 8 or a 9 out of 10 from some huge publication, then it was just written off as being a bad game. This was really, I think, the apex of the life cycle for the PlayStation 3 and the Xbox 360. Gaming culture, I'd argue, was at an all-time high, so for something to come along that wasn't this kind of unbridled masterpiece like Arkham City or Dead Space 2, well, then it just didn't cut the mustard. This is the case with Red Faction Armageddon. You don't get off that easy. And yet, despite essentially killing the franchise off, I have to admit, I still don't hate this thing. I can think of far worse third-person shooters, and I can also think of far worse games that came out in 2011 bringing the whole thing to an end, I've got to say that overall, I think Red Faction had a pretty good run. It didn't get bogged down with a dozen sequels or crappy spin-offs, and the fact that you can count every entry on one hand is something that's a bit of an alien concept these days. You've got four games here that are unique and really different from each other, and despite their faults, they've lingered in the minds of gamers for years now, and will probably continue to do so for the years to come. A part of me kind of wishes that Volition would remake the first game with like a new engine or something, but then seeing how they're treating the new Saints Row, well then maybe they should just leave it the hell alone. I would settle for a spiritual successor though, one that lets me shoot guys through solid walls or chase down fleeing security guards with an automatic shotgun. Traitor! We need to be moving! Right, so if you're still watching, well thanks for sticking around and let me give a final shout out to my sponsor, SteelSeries. SteelSeries makes some of the best gaming peripherals from headsets, keyboards, mice, and gaming pads, all synced together with a handy program that lets you modify the hell out of them. 
I'm a bit of a stickler for high quality mouses and keyboards, and whether you're playing a game that's eight months old or eight years old, it makes a huge difference in how well something handles. I would never recommend something that I don't use myself, and I'm pretty stoked to be able to offer a discount to people looking at buying some new gear. So just make sure to use that Chad promo code GMAN at checkout to get 12% off your next order. And as always, thanks for watching. Thank <laughs> you.